Good evening, everyone. Come on in and have a seat. I know you guys are all still finding seats. It's good to see everybody today. There looked like there was a um, very vigorous game of kickball earlier tonight. I don't know who won, but... You... Okay. You guys won? Bobby, you won? All right. All right, go ahead and come in and have a seat, guys. So glad everybody is back for another night, um, you know, discussing such an important topic of how we are the image of God. So tonight, I have Raina up here with me, and we're just going to chat a little bit. And as Chaplain Josh was saying, you know, we're all made in the image of God, and we all are unique and special and have different things about us that makes us who we are. So Raina is a four-year senior. senior and um, you guys also know she's part of SA as well, our fabulous SA this year. And I just wanted to ask, though, Reyna, where are you from? I am from South Korea. <laughs> okay, so that's a long ways away from here. So when did you come to the United States? I came to the States when I was 12 years old. I was sixth grader in Korea, and I came in as fifth graders in the U.S., yeah, because the school system is a little bit, or the grades are a little bit different, right, between the countries? Um, it's not necessarily that big of a difference, but my parents thought it would be easier for me to start from elementary school okay. than middle school. Did you have, how was it like learning English? Or did you already know some English when you were in Korea? I knew basic English, but I was too shy to speak in class, so... Um, some kids were actually surprised when I first spoke, like, spoke up to them because they thought I didn't speak at all. <laughs> and when you say basic English, just like generic terms or just a little bit, you know, what, what was maybe some of the harder words or things to like learn coming into the States? Well, usually in elementary schools in Korea, they would teach like, hi, how are you? What's your name? My name is Rina, <laughs> kind of basic things. So those were the English that I knew. Okay. Um, so you came over here, and then how did you find out about GCA? Um, I went to Adventist Middle School when I first came to the States, so I found out about GCA there. And also my brother went to GCA for two years, so I heard about GCA from him. Okay. And what's been kind of one of your favorite things or a highlight of your time here at GCA? Um, there's a lot. Um, I would say joining all the activities or like all the things that I'm in right now, Camerata, SA, and just getting to know new people in general. Okay, so now like, yeah, you've been here for, well, and you've been here in the States longer than your time at GCA since you came when you were in middle school, but what's something that you miss about being home in Korea? I definitely miss being able to walk around wherever I want to go to. Like, Korea is a small country, so we can always walk just to stores or, like, go shopping whenever we want to. Okay, so you have to drive somewhere here in the States, right? <laughs> it's not as easy to get around. Okay, um, what, tell me, yeah, and Mr. you might like this because, you know, she was talking about how much she likes food. So tell me, what is... A, f a dish that you really like from Korea that you do not get here in the States? Um, my favorite Korean food is kimchi jjigae, which is, um, it's like a stew, but with kimchi inside with tofu and a lot of veggies. Okay, and what's kimchi for, for people who don't know what that term is? What's that kind of made of? Kimchi is um, Korean traditional food. Um, it's made out of cabbage and red pepper and a lot of other stuff. <laughs> a lot of other stuff. Um, well, I hear it. Is it spi it's spicy though, right? Kimchi is. Um, <laughs> I would say it's like mac and cheese in states. Like how every house, like there's different recipes. Okay. <laughs> so it's different. That's a good analogy. <laughs> um, I knew my brother when he was living at Southern. He had friends who made kimchi, and the dean told them he, they could never make it again in their room because it stunk up the whole dorm. So. Anyways, my last question is, like, what would you like people to understand kind of about your culture, about who you are? 
Um, the biggest struggle that I had when I first came to States was people just assuming my ethnicity. Um, it's kind of like people assuming all Hispanics are like Mexican. They would assume Asian students are Chinese just because I'm Asian. And I wish people actually came up to me and they actually got to know me instead of just assuming who I am. That's wonderful. All right, if we could bow our heads for prayer and we'll get started this evening with the rest of our program. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much uh, for your love for us. And thank you that you take the time to get to know each one of us. And you call us by name and you know who we are and you love us for the unique way that you have made us. And Lord, may we take that time to get to know the people around us and may we be mindful of, of who the unique individuals that, we, that you have made us to be. May we take that time and just show that love to everyone we meet. We love you so much, and Lord, I just pray that you would please be with this program and that you would um, just help us to gain a deeper understanding of who we are through your eyes tonight. In your name we pray, amen. Welcome to the third night of week of prayer. We're so glad you guys are here to worship with us this evening. Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's just take these next few minutes to invite the Holy Spirit to worship with us this evening.
I forget who you are and who you have been. A mighty God, perfect in peace. My chance.
truth light even in darkness your truth lights a beautiful spark in this heart and soul be still So we shouldn't worry, we should never fear, you are always here. Please bless the speaker, please bless everyone here, and please help us have a good night. Amen. Hello you guys. How blessed I have been by the praise and worship this week. My church back home is not open yet, so it has been months and months and months since I've got to enjoy live praise and worship. So thank you. Every hand that's been on it, every musician that's played, every singer that's sung, it has blessed my spirit. It's so good to worship together again with other people. So we have been on a journey this week. We've been joining together, really finding out that God desires to use our lives to paint a portrait to a watching world of a creator, a friend, a redeemer, a lover, a forgiver, so that those in pain, those in need, which is all of us, can see a Savior who did the ultimate in order to give everlasting life to anyone who would receive it. We started with Job on night number one and we saw how Job and his friends all had a lie that caused them to believe a falsehood about God, which caused them to paint some portraits of God which were not true. Job nor his friends, either one knew the backstory to what was going on in heaven. That it was actually Satan who was the author and originator of all the destruction that Job was facing. So Job and his friends stood on the belief that they'd had for a long time that that, that tragedy, that hurt, that pain, that loss, that death was authored by God as a consequence of their sin. And so in believing, they painted a portrait of God that was not a full and accurate portrait of God. Then we looked last night and we saw beautifully in John chapter 9 as we binge read the Bible. I'm so glad you binge read the Bible with me and I hope you do it from now on out. We saw this beautiful example of being born again. How the blind man was born from birth without sight and God came in the form of Jesus Christ and gave him something he never could have given himself. 
We saw how Christ walked along with this blind man, and this blind man began to surrender to Christ. In doing so, he grew and grew and grew and became a more beautiful and accurate portrait of who God is to a watching world. He was honest and repeatedly told the truth to all the naysayers, to all the haters, even to his parents who didn't want to profess what actually happened. This is the goodness of God and what he will do in each one of our lives as well if we allow him to make us a canvas for him to paint a portrait of himself upon. I hope you've noticed that I am passionate about the word of God. I actually want to share with you um, my ministry. It is R12-2 and it comes from Romans 12-2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed into a new person by allowing God to change the way that we think. And the reason I want to share this with you is one, because I'd love to stay in touch with you. Please follow me on Instagram. You see the at tag there. But two, and more importantly, not that I don't want to stay in contact with you, I do, but more importantly, on my webpage, you'll find free resources. If you just go to the webpage, you scroll down, there's a green button and it says resources. And under those resources tab, it's all different ways that you can study the Bible on a daily basis in deep and meaningful ways. Ways that you can turn it into a group study with some of your friends in the dorm or some of your friends in the village or some of your friends on Sabbath morning. But being in the word of God will daily allow you, just like the blind man from yesterday, to grow in his likeness and allow him to paint a more accurate picture of himself upon your life and upon my life. So today we're going to do something a little bit different. It says in Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11, just like the rain and the snow fall from heaven and they water the earth and they change the earth, they give the earth nutrients and then the earth produces a harvest, it promises in verse 11 that God's word will do the same exact thing in your life and in my life. When God sends forth his word, it says it will always produce a harvest. So today we're going to look at one simple verse. It's a truth that will change your life if you allow it to really make you think differently about who you are and whose you are. And we're going to do this exercise because Jesus was the perfect person to do this. Jesus always used out-of-the-box ways to teach lasting lessons. So tonight we're not going to have a traditional sermon. We're going to use an out-of-the-box way, but by the time we end tonight, I believe this verse will be so deeply cemented in you that you will remember it for years and years to come. But I need your help during this exercise because there's a lot of us in order to get through the exercise and for it to be meaningful for all of us, you need to be conscious of your neighbor and conscious of the space around you. Everybody has on their mask. We want that handled first. So please keep on your mask. We're actually going to be allowing you to respond to four different options throughout the evening tonight. And we've separated the gym into four different quadrants. So you know where the middle of the gym is from front to back. You know where the middle of the gym is from side to side. If you look, you'll see number one here on the front corner. That's quadrant run number one. If you look on this second, you'll see number two. That's quadrant number two. If you look all the way in the back on the tall post, you'll see number three. That's quadrant number three. And if you look in the other direction, that's quadrant number four. All right? So we know you're going to be closer than six feet, but please be mindful of the people around you, mindful that your mask is on, and be mindful that when you stand up to move to your quadrant, I want you to do so in silence, in silence. So let's see if we can practice. Everybody stand up. You guys can do it. Okay, sit down. So. When I ask you to stand up and make your choice, you're going to do it in silence. You stand up silently and you simply walk to the quadrant that you're choosing. Now, once you get there, I'm going to give you some prompts that will require you to talk to one another. But the transitions between your chair and your quadrant or your quadrant and your next quadrant should be nice, quiet transitions. Everybody in? Thumbs up if you're in. All right, so here we go. Let's live here. I want you to imagine that you have a choice 
there's no financial obligation on your part, but you get to pick your ideal place to live. And we're going to go through a series of options about how you would end up describing your ideal place to live. So the first thing that we're going to let you decide is what will your backyard look like? So everybody stay seated. I'm going to go through all four options. And then once I go through all four options, I'm going to ask you to stand quietly and actually walk to the quadrant that you would choose. Your backyard. Option number one. Option number two. Option number three. Or option number four. Have a good look at them. Now quietly stand to your feet and go to the option that you would choose. You can spread out all the way to the center line of the gym. So the center forward is option number one and two. The center back is option number three and four. All right, in silence now, please. In silence now, please. I hope you'll take a look around and notice that options number one and two, the mountains and the lake and the beach definitely got the most takers for their backyard. We have a few people back there that love the desert and maybe a few that love the forest. But by and large, we have the beach and the mountains and the lake. All right, standing just where you are, turn so that you can see the monitors again. And here is your next option. Please remember as you transition to your next choice to do so quietly. Options again. You've picked your perfect backyard. Now I'd like you to pick the house you want to put on your ideal piece of land. Option number one. Not too shabby, not too shabby. Option number two. Option number three. Last and final option, option number four. Please transition to your ideal home. All right, quiet now, quiet now. Take a look around. I think by and large, option number one with the huge pool and the modern looking facade, get the winning choice. But we have a lot of winners over here in the beach bungalow and it looks like we have a lot of people back there. And I'm sorry, a lot of winners in the beach bungalow in the back, but a lot of winners here for the log cabin too. <laughs> All right, here we go. Please silently now pay attention to your next choice. You've picked your land. You've picked the house you want to put on your land. What will be your ideal bathroom? What will be your ideal bathroom? Quiet now. Option number one. Option number two. 
Option number three. And option number four. Make your way to your next choice, please. Make your way to your next choice. gracefully girl you did it gracefully all right just from a quick survey it looks like option number one has a whole group of people and option number three has a whole group of people options number two and four you held your own I want you to find one person and tell them why you chose the bathroom that you chose. Find one person and tell them why you chose the bathroom that you chose. All right, quiet now. Quiet now. Let's progress. What will your next choice be? Your kitchen. Option number one for your kitchen. Not too shabby. Option number two for your kitchen. Option number three for your kitchen. And option number four for your kitchen. Please transition to your choice. Please transition to your choice. Option number four got a lot of love on the kitchen. It looks like option number two got the next best amount. Oh, might it be option number three? This is really close, option two and three. All right, what will be the next room you get to choose for your ideal home, on your ideal piece of land, with your ideal bathroom? Let's choose your entertainment room. Option number one. Option number two. Option number three. Wait for it. Just wait for it. Option number four. Make a transition to the option of your choice, your entertainment room. Mm -hmm. 
Now find one other person and tell them why you chose that as your ideal entertainment room. Find one other person and tell them why you chose that as your entertainment room. Quiet now, please. Quiet now, please. Let's continue with our selections. We're going to change pace just a little bit, but you still have a choice. And you have to make a choice. Let's not live here. You spent the last slides really dreaming about some of the most beautiful spaces and beautiful places that you could live. No strings attached, no money involved. In this next section, you're going to have to make a choice between one of four choices. And you're going to need to imagine the most uncomfortable, the most hideous, and the most obnoxious place for you to live. You're not choosing the best of evils. You're choosing what would really be the most hideous place for you to live, the most uncomfortable place for you to live. Quiet now. Quiet now. Let's choose the worst backyard. You have, must choose one of these four. Option number one. Option number two. Option number three. That's a sewer drain, in case you didn't know. Or option number four. Transition to the land that would be the most difficult for you to live on. Which of these would be the most difficult for you to live on? All right, by and large, it looks like number three, which is the sewage drain, would be the most difficult for the majority of people. Quiet now, please. Quiet now, please. Let's choose our next option. You have the piece of land, but which of these would be the worst house for you to have to live in? Option number one, and I did option number two at the same time. Option number three, or option number four. Transition, which would be the worst for you to live in?
quiet now, please. It looks by and large that option number three, the leaf teepee, and possibly option number one, the tin hut, were the two worst options. Let's see what your next choice is in the most uncomfortable place that you could live. I want you to consider the worst interior. What would be the worst interior for you to live in? And remember, you must live in one of them. Option number one. Option number two. Option number three. Or option number four. Which of these would be the worst for you to live in? Quiet now, please. Quiet now, please. Quiet now, please. I want you in dead silence. Dead silence. Without saying a word using only your eyes to look at one person next to you and just express to them with your eyes only the terror of living in this worst impossible interior. Thank you, friends. Please return to your seats. Please return to your seats. Man, you guys picked some sweet homes. I saw a lot of you pick a beach cottage on a nice crystal blue ocean front. I saw many of you pick a beautifully modern exterior with a crystal clear pool. I saw you pick the sweetest game room of your dreams, no strings attached. But then when it came to picking the worst place to live, I saw some looks of terror. I saw people literally running away from the screen at just seeing a picture of some of the disgusting places that I made you choose from. As you were walking back to your seats, one young man walked up and said, just for the record, I'd rather be homeless than live in the interiors that you gave us the option for. I want you to consider tonight, friends, as you thought about the place that you had to live, Describe to yourself. I don't want it to be a conversation with anyone else. I want you just to thoughtfully reflect inside your own mind. What would make that home so uncomfortable for me? What would make that home so uncomfortable for me? And then I want you to ask yourself, 
what would be the hardest thing for me about living in that home? What would be the hardest thing for me about living in that home? And then lastly, I want you to ask yourself, what would be the first thing that I would want to change about the worst home I just picked out? What would be the worst thing, but the first thing that I would definitely want to change about that worst home that I just picked out? I want you to recognize, friends, I think, yeah, there we go. I want you to recognize, friends, that God left the perfect scenery, the perfect piece of land. God left the perfect living room, dining room, kitchen. God left the perfect game room, all to come down and live inside of me and live inside of you. It was his choice to leave perfection and he didn't just leave it for the 33 years that he walked on life. God himself still chooses you who said, I accept you, Lord. I want to be born again. God from that day forward said, I will make you son, I will make you, daughter, my home. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you, whom you've received as a gift from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. You were purchased with the precious blood of Jesus, and he has made you home. He's made you home. Now, I don't know about you, friends, but I can only tell you as I examine my own life, Christ in the form of the Holy Ghost living inside of June would like me living inside of a cockroach-infested house day in and day out. Because no matter how good I think I am, I'm nowhere close to the perfection of where God came from. I want to ask you today, friends, what kind of house are you for God? What's the foundation of your home? Is it arrogance that God finds when he walks in the door? Is it hatred that God finds when he moved into you? Is it jealousy or unbelief that God finds as he nestles into your living room? Maybe God finds some kindness there and it's just a peace and a respite for him maybe God finds some faithfulness there but this is what God promises to do no matter what he finds when he moves into you no matter what the state if it's feels like a chain smoker lived there for 48 years or if it's so filthy that you can't even see the floor or if it's cockroach infested or mice or literally having litter after litter everywhere what God promises to do when he moves inside of you is actually renovate and begin the process with your permission of changing you from the inside out into a man and a woman who daily and continually will look more and more like him. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, we are the temple of the living God. God himself has said, I will live in them. I will walk among them and they will be my people and I will be their God. And him living in us, friends, is the best deal that ever could have happened to us. He's daily promising and committing to change you from the inside out. But I need you to know, friends, that our God is a gentleman and he will not open doors that you will not allow him to open. So some of you have some hot mess bedrooms 
and you let God do whatever he wants in the living room, but you never let him open the door to the bedroom. And some of you, including me, have some hot mess kitchens, and we let God handle the bathroom. He stripped down the shower, he put up new tile, but we won't let God in the kitchen. And God's saying tonight, please, daughter, please, son, I see myself. I created you in my image. I know it's in there. Let me remodel, because I will make you look like me. God, thank you. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you, Father, for your craftsmanship, because you're doing in our lives what no one else can ever possibly do. So tonight, Father, in the quietness of this moment, with every heart in this room, you know there's some people who need to say, God, I've been keeping you out of that closet, and I'm inviting you in there right now. I thank you for your willingness to go in, God, and with the gentleness of the most gentle hand, reconstruct our spaces. <laughs>